everything related to governance, uh, to DAOs in, in general for the Clearos DAO, but also uh, other DAOs, uh, as we have some products that can be useful for DAOs at uh, Clearos. Um, and also, uh, I'm in this ecosystem since 2017. I'm involved in a small uh, VC, VC DAO, uh, basically, and I'm also a delegate in Paladin DAO uh, governance. Wonderful. So, Thanks. Yeah. Vincent? I'm Vincent. I'm with uh, Viable Community. And recently, we, we connected to Refi DAO as a local node in uh, The Hague. So pretty new to the Web3 space. And this is the first session that we're joining. So I'm really curious and already receiving a lot of useful information. Nice to awesome. meet you all. Thank you. Uh, time it? or timed? If not, we'll skip to Andre. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Andre. I'm with uh, Mitis Foundation. I'm in charge of uh, governance and processes and looking forward to get uh, governance related information from this call. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Nick, our good friend Nick has been here, I think, every week. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yep, uh, Nick, uh, working on uh, Gamify Gov as a governance DAO to support local communities, focusing on endurance sports from the beginning. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing everyone's uh, thoughts on the panel. Awesome. Birds are fake. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Bo. Um, birds are fake online. Um, I've been in and around DAOs for like a long time, going back, you know, for a while, uh, MakerDAO, uh, initially, I also just really dig um, stable coins. Uh, so like Rye, Hi, uh, and all those evolutions. Uh, right now, I'm working on a decentralized e-commerce solution called Hamza. Um, and yeah, so we're actually building a lot of partnerships in the ecosystem, including with Claros. And Alex, I actually saw you just this weekend at uh, East Berlin. Uh, so I saw you speak on the um, MetaMask, or sorry, on the uh, Snapshot Claros module. Um, so yeah, really excited also for this panel. Awesome. And Alex, feel free to put the link to your talk if it's available um, in the chat. And then uh, Katrina, or Katarina, pardon me. Yeah, um, Katarina here from Andau Together Crew, focusing on community health and building sustainable relationship looking forward to the, the panel great uh kara lovely kara see her oh hi everybody um yes i'm kara and i have an organization called c3 and our uh, focus is on accessibility and equity in web3 specifically with women and non-binary professionals um and we're working on our dao so this is it's super helpful and i think our goal is pretty much well two goals with the DAO is unifying the women in web3 ecosystem so i've mentioned on a previous call we have a um a lot we've aggregated a database of the other organizations so we hope to all come together and work on topics like financial inclusion thank you and zell Hello everyone, my name is Zal. Um, my username is Better Call Zal. I'm working on the Z Talent Artist Organization, also known as ZAO. We are currently a collective of music and tech enthusiasts, but we are building towards becoming a full-fledged DAO. Um, and I just love all of the talks whenever I join in here, hearing all the amazing insights. So thank you for letting me join. Thanks, and I think last, SAS, did I see a SAS? Yes. And if not SAS, Jay Biddle is the last one then. SAS, go ahead. Oh, you're muted, sorry. Is it working? Am I audible? Yep. yep. Hi guys, uh, I um, started my web journey being a DAO at OnDeck and thereafter dabbling in a bunch of DAOs. 
uh, currently part of on-chain monkey dao dabbling a little bit on uh, cabin dao and uh, currently uh, gearing up for on-chain summer on base as well uh, currently a professor of uh, uh, venture capital and entrepreneurship in a mexican university and i'm trying to introduce daos as a subject in my curriculum as well so that's my awesome. Yes. awesome awesome and then if uh jay biddle wants to go i think that's it Oh, is this, is this me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Ms. Klaus. Um, I'm a colleague of uh, Alex. And um, awesome. um, this is the first time I'm attending. So, um, yeah, I'm very excited to be here. Great. I'm a developer, by the way. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay. Uh, well, this is Mustache. If you haven't met Mustache yet, now you have. Um, this is uh, the time of day where he needs to be loved. So there you go. Um, so, okay, like governance, uh, arguably the hardest part about running a DAO, um, outside of maybe knowledge management, um, which is not a unique problem to DAOs, right? Um, so a little bit more universal of, a, of an issue. Um, but yeah, on-chain governance um, is a challenge uh, because people don't like to vote and there's lots of issues um, and it costs gas and we have infrastructure issues and we have to coordinate a lot of people's, um, you know, interests alongside, you know, like what the DAO's actual mission and purpose are, right? So governance really starts to get into how do you put your mission into action, right? How do you actually do the thing that your DAO says it wants to do? Um, so that, you know, sort of naturally brings up why Kleros is here, why Alex is here, um, because, um, uh, what you don't want is your DAO to get mired in problems, um, that they can't figure out how to, uh, come to some sort of resolution about, right? So how do you build consensus? How do you resolve conflict? How do you move projects forward? Um, uh, and what kind of on-chain arbitration or mediation mechanisms are there available to do so. And this really starts to become a problem when we scale our DAOs, right? When it's just the six of us on a call about something, it's very, you know, how we approach governance is really different than when we have, you know, 300 people or we have a treasury of 1 million <laughs> you know, dollars. Um, if we have a treasury of $500, it's very, very different, right? So um, the risk reward um, uh, uh, measures that we take as DAO members, as delegates, um, really changes the more the DAO scales. So I'd like to hear, um, you know, a lot of the DAO, a lot of the, this is a mixed group of people with very new in the DAO space and very like a lot of experience in the DAO space, right? Maker DAO back all the way to 2017 with Bo, like very long, deep experience, even though, right, this is a new field. He has like a long set of experiences around how you actually manage scaling a DAO and the complications that come from that. And then like, you know, our DAO, Education DAO, is a baby DAO that has almost no treasury and like five people. So um, very different needs around governance. And so what I'd like to hear, um, what I would like to hear from Alex around how do you, um, what, Cler what Cleros does, but then also more broadly, how you put um, measures into place to support a DAO at different life stages within that DAO. Right. Um, because many of us on this call believe that just starting a DAO and putting all these structures in place before you have anything to do. Right. There's an argument to be said for not putting a lot of structure in until you need the structure. There's also the argument for putting the structure in so that when you need it, it's there. Right. And how do you balance those two tensions? So, um, yeah, I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Alex and um, and then we'll we'll take it from there. I can say two words about um, so, yeah, it's a broad question. So I can say two words, two words about first uh, about Kleros. So, yeah, for people that are not familiar with the pro protocol for them to understand um, the idea of Kleros, it's to it's a decentralized 
dispute uh, resolution protocol. So the interesting point is it can be seen as well as a subjective oracle. So basically, when you have some um, people that disagree on a specific topic, on a specific case, uh, it's like it can be seen as subjective data. Um, Kleros, basically at Kleros, we have built a pro protocol. We are here since 2017, where we have basically jurors uh, and anybody can join. So it's permissionless, it's transparent. Uh, you need to stake our token. And they are financially incentivized to look at a case, basically, and to um, vote and choose the more coherent answer. And the interesting point with that is if basically one specific party disagree with the judgment, uh, you can do an appeal. By doing an appeal, it will draw even more jurors and there will be another round with more people looking into it. So it's a way basically, and, and you can do several rounds like that. So it's a way basically to get, I would say basically this kind of wisdom of a crowd without having to pay for like a lot of jurors from the start, because basically you just start to pay for like a, a first set of three jurors and um, this can grow. So the, the first jurors needs to think about like, what should I vote? Like what um, the majority would say. So that's the conceptual thing. Um, and, and this can be useful for dispute resolution, for arbitra arbitration. And uh, we know that uh, that can be a big, a, a big topic within DAOs because you have all this system of like grants, committee, all these decisions at some point that need to be taken. And most of the time uh, you have a foundation or you have a, a central party that is taking this decision. Uh, the interesting point of Kleros is the fact that you can rely as Kleros as a neutral third party in order basically uh, to uh, take, this, uh, take this decision. It's also a way uh, to, I would say, externalize uh, the drama out of your DAO basically, and to have this neutral third party uh, into it. So that's the, a bit the general overview. Um, so then in terms of like following, uh, yeah, I think DAOs are very complex, uh, complex topic. Um, it's, it's a journey, I think. Decentralization is a journey. We see a lot of DAOs that are very young, that are very centralized, they rely on multisig. Um, I do believe the more a uh, DAO mature, the more it should decentralize at different level uh, and also maybe organize itself with specific committees and things like that um, in order to grow. And at some point, I think also things like constitutions are very interesting for DAOs um, because it allows basically to have these values and this structure to be uh, basically in enforced uh, and, and Kleros can also help for that. So that's a, a, a general um, answer to, to, to your questions. Thank you. Um, would your colleague like to say anything by chance? You, no, no pressure to, just wanted to give you the opportunity. Um, maybe I'll just um, add a little bit on the voting with the majority part, um, I think it makes more sense um, if we um, keep in mind that the jurors don't know how many rounds there might be and whether the, the round that they're currently voting in is the ultimate, the last round. Because ultimately, they will be penalized or rewarded depending on, on the winning uh, vote of the, of the final round. Um, so that's an incentive actually to really do their homework and um, vote on the, the merits of the, the case. Uh, so I think that's a fairly unique uh, feature as a voting mechanism compared to the, the rest of the voting systems for governance um, that we, we have at Clearos for arbitration. Thank you. Um, okay, um, so, uh, Taking that point, I'm wondering, Alex, if you can give us um, an actual example of an arbitration that you have done uh, for, let's say not a huge DAO, let's say like a, a medium-sized DAO, um, to give some of the people here an example of the kinds of conflicts or um, issues that, that come to you for arbitration. 
Yeah, if we take um, the um, specific use case of DAOs, uh, we have um, some specific use case. I'm thinking about one in specific with one inch DAO. Um, that is a relatively big DAO, but uh, I mean, there are bigger ones uh, around there, like uh, Maker or Ave are way much bigger. Uh, so with one inch, basically, we have this. Um, this, this, they have this module in, installed uh, in their safe um, mm -hmm. that is leveraging Keros technology. So uh, this module allows to have optimistic governance process and to have uh, gasless voting. So basically, they have a community of one inch token holder that can vote. They vote on the one inch uh, snapshots uh, space, basically. Um, and the interesting point is basically when the proposal is prepared, the person that prepared the proposal already put the transaction that will be executed by the multisig. So it's a way for the people to have a, a real voting power and, and to really be able to enforce in a trustless way, in a permissionless way, a, um, a transaction and a proposal that has been bought. And that's very uh, powerful because, you know, most of the time, what happens is like people vote on snapshots and then the multisig do what they want. If they don't want to execute, they don't execute it. If they want to execute, they execute. In this in this case, they have no choice. So you, you, we are, by this use case, really enforcing and empowering the community. Mm -hmm. The interesting point is it's an optimistic process. So some of you might know about optimistic rollup. Uh, here, the idea is the same with optimistic governance. Basically, you prepare a transaction and um, you basically put a deposit in order to attest that uh, this transaction is matching with the proposal that has passed. If basically it's right and you didn't make a mistake or you're not trying to attack the system, all good basically and the transaction is executed. In this case, Kleros is not in the loop. Uh, we are just entering in the loop in the case of some if somebody tried to challenge one of these transactions because somebody is trying to attack the system or because somebody is trying to manipulate something or maybe because something somebody made an error. So we had a case uh, with one inch and actually it was more a testing case. It was done, uh, it was triggered basically by uh, the one inch team that they call for arbitration. So they request basically uh, an arbitration from uh, jurors and uh, the case went to Kleros. Uh, the Kleros, uh, it went to a specific court that is the blockchain technical court. So in this specific court, we have some people that are uh, quite technical. So they know how to read a uh, transaction in solidity. So they look at the transaction, they look at the proposal on snapshot, they look at the hash and the batch, all these technical things. And basically they resume that uh, this, um, in this case, it was a transaction that was invalid. So they all put a no, basically, and the transaction was blocked by Kleros, as it should have been. So um, yeah, th basically, that's a concrete um, example of like a very specific, uh, it's a bit technical, but it's an optimistic governance process. And all Kleros can basically be part of this system, yeah. Great, thank you so much. Um, are there any questions from the group? Um, is there anything somebody doesn't understand? Um, Optimistic, like Alex said, basically means it goes through unless it's challenged. Um, what was another term you used that I wanted to make sure people understood? Um, one inch is a really big uh, wallet, right? It's a wallet protocol, right? Um, it's an aggregator. Yeah, one inch is an aggregator. So it's built on top. It's basically uh, allowing you to uh, tap on, um, it's finding you the best route in order to do a swap. So yeah. uh, it can go to Uniswap, it can go to SushiSwap, it's on top of like a uh, right. decentralized exchange. We have a really angry unicorn um, logo. Exactly. Logo, <laughs> in case you see it. Um, so yeah, for the people who are newer into the DAO space, please put your questions in the chat or raise your hand as Spencer just did, one sec, Spence. Um, and then um, if any of you uh, are fast with the keyboard and want to put links in as Alex or anybody else is talking uh, about things that are being referenced, uh, please feel free to do that also. Like I said, this is a pretty mixed group. Um, so I want to make sure that context wise, everyone is understanding um, what we are talking about. Uh, go ahead, Spencer. 
Yeah, just yeah. A, a quick question for, for Alex about Claris's processes. Um, would organizations approach Claris once they have some dispute or would they work with Claris to set up dispute resolution processes like ahead of time, generally? Uh, so <clears throat> if we take, if we talk into, in specific into DAOs, basically there is this, um, um, so yeah, our focus is on this specific product I have mentioned, basically allowing to do off-chain, basically um, voting and on-chain execution in a trustless way with this optimistic governance process. So that's really uh, one tool that we think is really useful, especially when you know uh, gas fees can be pretty expensive. Uh, but you can definitely think about other uh, use cases and it can be like, yeah, if a, like, for instance, if we take a DAO like Vita DAO, they have agreed that if a specific dispute uh, occurred within the DAO, uh, one of one of, I think, the default tool they will they will use would be Kleros, basically. Uh, but it's, it will be necessary for them to load basically uh, all the different proof uh, in Kleros uh, to pay the arbitration fees. And then the Claros protocol uh, will do will do its job. Okay. So, so it, just one one thing to clarify there. So this is yeah. a situation where an organization like like Vita DAO and say say in their like operating agreement, they could have some provision for dispute resolution and specify that Claros will be like their first choice of like using Claros for dispute resolution. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah. It it exists exactly. Uh, if you if you look at yeah at Vita DAO. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, that was the thing I wanted to bring up. You, you know, you talked about Snapshot. So Snapshot, um, for anyone who doesn't know, is an off-chain voting platform, right? Where basically you're not spending any gas to say, I would support this, or I would not support this, or I might support this. Um, and it's used by a lot of DAOs. Um, I I don't love Snapshot as a tool, but a, a lot of people do like Snapshot. Um, so if you were, and one of the reasons Clara, like Alex was talking about Snapshot is just because someone, a group votes a certain way on Snapshot, there's no executionable functionality, right? Built into it because it's not a smart contract. So if people vote yes, you still, whoever has, uh, a signature ability on the multi-sig still has to execute that action, right? And that's where he's saying there can be a dispute where somebody can in fact ignore whatever happens on Snapshot and do what they want if enough of the multi-sig, whatever minimum number, agree to do that, right? So that's where the arbitration or, or dispute resolution uh, function then comes in. So this is, um, this is part of the DAO governance that is different from governance in other types of decentralized organizing, right? So in a lot of, you know, I don't know, your block club, your PTA, your bicycling club, whatever, right? Um, there's no on-chain activity, right? So what people, wherever they publicly announce what they want, Right. It's public in a way that then the people who have to take action on that have to recognize that. Right. That's built into the to the governance framework. And what we're saying here is as DAOs, as a fundamental part of our existence is on chain. Right. And having our governance on chain as proof of what we have done and why we have done it. That's why that's so important. And that's why we have to have mechanisms to enforce right the will of the group um so it is that because you know governance people think like tokens money you know one one vote one uh, you know one token one vote or or they think about okay well how do we actually enforce what we're saying we want to do so governance um is a really broad broad topic um, and that's one of the reasons Spencer is here for the second half for us to actually think through what do we uh, what do we document and what do we put into the structures of how our DAOs work in our operating agreements so that we are clear about who does what, when and how. Right. Um, and that sort of ties into last week's talk about tooling. Um, what are these various tools that we have and what are we trying to use our tools to execute? Are we trying to take a general temperature check of how people are feeling 
And do we use that? Do we use Discord for that? Or do we use Snapshot for that, right? There's a lot of tools, but the smart contract execution ability through the multi-sig, um, I mean, that is the, that is like the, I don't know, that's the on-chain, like this actually happened and this is what, you know, happens as a result of that. Um, and that's why arbitration in this field is like very technical because you have to be able to read smart contracts. You've got to be able to trace things. You've got, you've got to be able to see where tokens go, right? So it's a very specific subspecialty of, um, of engineers that we're building as a community, right? We're building a community of expertise here um, that is unlike any other really group um, that we have so far around governance. One moment. <laughs> the the husband came in and needed to talk to me it's the first day of summer so kids are out of school so everything's a little you know a little wonky um okay so let me just make sure i'm not missing anything here okay cool awesome all right so um i think um at this point, what I would like to ask um, any of our DAOs that are actually incubating. So um, Katerina, Nick, Kara, um, anybody, do you have any governance questions um, either around dispute resolution or around how you um, handle collating opinion in your DAOs that you would like to that you'd like to bring up to the group. I had a related question. So because there's a lot of like, I guess, different best practices and tooling and everything, um, do we have, I guess, standards for like having flexibility for a DAO to like, because the processes and community are going to evolve over time, is there an approach to like go on chain with a mechanism that is capable of evolving, like with some flexibility? I can try to answer this question. I think it's um, <clears throat> it's a very difficult question, um, and I feel that's I mean I, I think that's something that all the DAO are seeking. Um, because uh, in a DAO, you want to have this mix uh, between uh, flexibility, um, but you also want to have a, 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 a kind of rigidity as well. So you need to balance between both. You want to have flexibility to evolve, like if the community grows, uh, you, you want to have different process, etc. Uh, but you still want uh, some rigid rule and a governance structure. You don't. You want to have, for instance, some specific quorum or, or, or maybe sometimes some committees. So it's hard to find uh, the path between uh, these two. Uh, in terms of tooling and structure, uh, what I can mention is like many DAOs are, are using some tools that are very uh, famous in the industry. So uh, Lizzie uh, mentioned like Snapshot, that's a tool that's really used. In terms of multisig, it's safe. Uh, basically, you know, this safe uh, that is also the industry standard. So basically, you can have your first stage when a, very, a DAO is very young, when, when you have these two tools. And basically, the multi sig power has a lot of power, um, and it's kind of centralized. Then uh, you can take these two tools, add, for instance, something like uh, the module I talked about. It's a way to decentralize your multi sig. Um, and then you can even go further uh, with things like uh, constitution uh, to do in order to do constitutional check uh, with the same, same tool. Then you have also other toolings, things like ads protocol. Um, and I think they are very involved with, uh, with DAO Spring. Uh, that allows you, for instance, to give some roles uh, and create some specific committees, specific attribution on chain. And you can have this that evolves as well uh, with your DAO gro growing. Great, thank you. I think, uh, you know, we haven't talked a whole lot about hats yet. Um, they were like, super popular in the Dow December <laughs> talks, at least the ones that I talked about, or like 
helped with. Um, but I do think it is a useful um, thing to bring up around roles. And I know that Peth is really um, passionate about this particular type of organization um, around roles and making sure that everyone has clearly defined um, uh, uh responsibilities within their roles, right? And so what HATS allows is um, you to give someone permission to do X, Y, or Z, and that can be revoked by someone who wears a hat higher than them. Um, and so you can give people like in our, for example, in our, uh, in Education DAO, we've been playing around with the idea of um, well, it, it, not from a technical perspective because we haven't figured this out yet, but um, being a publisher, being edit an editor and being a writer, and then giving people, how do we decentralize giving people those various roles through HATS protocol so that we don't have to go in and manually do that for every single person we onboard into our DAO, right? Um, and so uh, it's sort of optimistic in the sense that um, you don't need people to vote on lots of things. You give them a authority that's delegatable through a various set of, of uh, responsibilities that are tied to a certain role or hat, right? Um, and so um, similar if we think about um, like uh, governance from a state perspective, right? That like legislators can write laws and vote on laws, but they can't judge laws, right? And presidents can sign laws, but they can't judge laws. They can't write laws, right? So that we 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 delegate various responsibilities and we ensure checks and balances between those responsibilities. And that's the next thing I really would like to talk about around governance is this idea of checks and balances. Um, I have been um, supporting Singularity Net's decentralization blueprint, and um, this is a very large company, right, with a lot of money. Um, a foundation that wants to decentralize into um, wants to, you know, rescind power from a central perspective and decentralize those decision making powers um, into the community. And the biggest question is really how do you ensure checks and balances? Um, so that nothing goes too far one way or too far the other way, which gets Nick to your question about flexibility, right? And how do we ensure that our DAO can move in the direction that the group wants it to move um, while still maintaining like an effective governance framework? So um, if anyone here ha has something they'd like to say about checks and balances and some tools that we can use to ensure that outside of HATS, I would love to hear that because arbitration is kind of like the last one, right? Ideally, you have checks and balances before you get to a conflict that eliminate most conflict. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. And I, I do have some, uh, I mean, it just like spam the, the chat with all these articles, but I've got one about a, one approach to checks and balances within DAOs or other on-chain organizations that, um, that attempts to address what can be seen as the, the main issue with like code is law or, or code's law where you have some some body of voters and if they if their votes deterministically trigger treasury disbursements or whatnot there can be some risk for either um like some kind of governance attack or some whale or some like un, unpredicted governance outcome that has liability implications for everyone involved uh, so here's one article about what I'm what I'm calling the fail safe committee but this does involve hats so I, I don't know if you want me to, to get it, into it yeah 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 it's fine this is a two-hour session we're stopping at the hour we're going to switch over to Spencer's talk just quickly to note that cool so I just I shared an article here I don't I don't need to get too uh too in depth there but there's a, a some provision like boilerplate provisions there and some diagrams illustrating how you can ha how you can have a, an on-chain community essentially be in charge of like a c-suite but you can still have this kind of um, backup or, or fail safe committee of, of individuals that can be elected. They can be the same as, as the kind of C-suite, but the idea is that they would only act, they would only override the DAO in situations stipulated in operating agreements where there's some governance contract malfunction or some governance attack or something. So that can be one way to check, like to enable a community of people to be in charge and kind of have like bottom up democracy for an organization if that's suitable for your organization but still have some kind of 
contingency plan for if there's a governance attack or something like that. Uh, it would all just depend on, on how, how, like what wording you would use in, in some operating agreement to outline when that failsafe committee would be able to override the community. Um, but yeah, so it, the article's there, if that's of interest to anyone, uh, that's, it could be one example of, of the checks and balances you're talking about, Elizabeth. Thanks. Um, another one is the idea of um, maybe not sub DAOs, but committees, right, uh, within your DAO that are empowered to do various actions um, that have maybe control over a wallet of theirs, um, colony, you know, the way colony is structured, the way they help you structure your DAO um, is that like every group does its, has its own decision-making power and you have to, it's optimistic also in the sense that you have to dispute something in order to try to reverse something. So um, one of the things that's nice about this is uh, as Jack, who, D Jack DeRose, I think, who's one of the colony founders, he gave this lovely image of like, well, do you want a marketer telling your engineer how to uh, <laughs> design the back end of your website? They might think they have a good opinion. They might think they have an informed opinion, but they're not an engineer. They're a marketer, right? Now, you could also argue that marketers actually always should be involved because um, <laughs> your product has to be used by real people and marketers are the ones that understand how real people operate. But that's a separate issue. Um, the point is that um, you really want your individual groups of experts to be empowered to do what they do best. I mean, you don't want to have micromanaging oversight that prevents them from doing their work or discourages them from trying out different things, right? Um, because what really moves projects forward is a combination of feeling like people can experiment, people can, people are empowered. Um, to use their own expertise, and that at the same time, everyone is aligned on a vision, right? That's really what moves projects of any kind forward. Um, and so uh, the idea of, of subcommittees or sub DAOs or, you know, um, however you want to describe that, that structure, um, is another way of checks and balances that um, I think are particularly effective in a decentralized, the more you decentralize, the more that can really be effective because you still have smaller communities of people who know each other, who trust one another, who can work together, um, that still filter up their results, right, um, to the larger organization. Um, and we saw that, for example, like in the Me Too movement, we see a lot of actual just like populist movements um, with uh, 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 Occupy Wall Street. You know, we saw how that was sort of replicated in smaller forms in lots of different places to sort of change a narrative. Right. Um, and I think a lot of DAOs, uh, the idea is that you can replicate and then you can replicate and then localize um, various projects. Refi DAO is a really good example of this, where you can localize um, uh, sets of philosophies, right? Um, because you're using people endemic to that area. Um, and you're using tools and ideas that are more broadly shared, right? So that shared vision, but then you really use local groups and you empower them uh, through a treasury, through um, voting mechanisms, right? To, to then do that work. Okay. Okay, talking about veto power here. Um, anyone want to chime in here? We have about 10 minutes before we switch over to the second half. Um, and if anyone has a, again, a particular case, um, that they want to think through, uh, with the DAO that you're starting or, or problems, maybe in former DAOs you've had and how it could have been addressed differently, happy to talk through that. Um, or I'm happy to throw out another question. Uh, I can address one of the, the questions in the, the mm -hmm. chat just say it instead, but um, uh, uh, Adam's question, uh, is it enough to design against governance attacks rather than giving people the power to retroactively nullify them? 
Um, I mean, in, in my experience, I think if uh, if you have a well-designed governance framework, you can prevent most, like like safeguard against the likelihood of, of most of these risks. But it, you can also probably find ways, depending on, on what your organization is, to like give certain voters the power to retroactively invalidate things should certain criteria be met. I mean, one, one example I, I experienced of this in a DAO where we did have a governance attack and where we didn't have the, any kind of framework to really deal with it. And we had to like figure out how to deal with it on the fly where one person had more voting power than like the 20 most active governance participants. And he was kind of like single-handedly blocking all these proposals. We had to like figure out a way to kind of weasel wordy issue our, our proposals in such a way as to like kind of give the power back to those people without breaking any initial promises about governance rights or anything. Uh, and it was like a, a total nightmare. And it ended up working out pretty well. Um, and we ended up facilitating like a rage quit. And I think people were as satisfied as they could be from a, a, a situation like that. But if we had things outlined very um, concisely and, and thoroughly ahead of time, we you know, could have avoided something like that. And it just, it sucked up so many people's uh, times for like uh, like a, a few weeks at least. It was crazy. Um, but I mean, I, I, it can only take you so far though. You know, you can't just eliminate all, all risks, I suppose. And I think that's a really good point about um, experience and expertise, right? Which are two different things. Um, you might have participated in a lot of DAOs and have a lot of experience, but if um, if you're not the one like critically thinking about how to eliminate those situations in the future or change them, then maybe you don't have the expertise to then guide other DAOs on how to do it differently. So. Um, just participating in a lot of DAOs means that you participate in a lot of DAOs. Really thinking through the governance challenges that various DAOs have had and how to address them is where the expertise comes in. And that's what um, a lot of people here have. And it's what other people in the DAO communities have and that we wanna make sure that you all have access to in thinking through how you set up your governance documents. Yeah, go ahead, Bo. Hey, on, on this topic, I've been, um, so uh, we're in the beginning stages of building out our DAO right now and specifically voting out or building out like the mechanism of voting power. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if anybody has any experience with like uh, Demirage uh, as like a voting power concept. Um, so like, I, I think I'm saying that D-E-M-U-R-R-A-G-E. -R -R -E. And so like the idea would be that um, you have a token, you stake the token in the the style of like a curve uh, voting mechanism, but the underlying voting power like disintegrates over time. Um, and if you have this like, or, or goes to like a treasury, which is then redistributing the token to active participants in a system. And I'm, I'm talking sort of in, in general sense, right? Like we have some specific ideas of how that would be implemented, but I'm wondering if anybody has... Uh, that right that like uh degree you know uh decays power over time and continues to distribute to active participants in the system if there's anybody who's been building smart contracts to that effect um or yeah where to look i guess for more information on on something like that or whether or not you think it's feasible at all i think it's totally feasible but <laughs> But I'm not a smart contract engineer, so uh, how to actually do that um, from from a like a I I, I totally think it's feasible. Um, to any anyone before I go any further, anyone have anything that they want to shout out about that idea? I had some thoughts on it, and you guys can give me feedback on how relevant it is. So. Um, I was thinking in terms of like the, I guess, accelerator startup world of where you typically have like, I guess they'll give you like 150,000 for some amount of equity. And I thought like a way to alleviate that is like you do the same like valuation on a yearly basis so that it, um, and you give part of that or you allow the community to like receive part of that. So that allows them to get like a set amount of power every year. So you have to kind of stay actively involved in the community to like, I guess, continue to maintain that level of authority that you have. So I, 
I'm not sure if that makes sense or. I think that makes sense. So demurrage is like the carrying cost of holding a currency, right? Um, I guess it comes from shipping initially, how long you freight was held by the ship and the cost of not delivering it on time, right? Um, so I think that's a great question, Bo. And also, again, to Spencer's point about like, what is your DAO doing? What's the actual function of your DAO? And are you going to have a token up front or are you not going to have a token up front, right? This really is different for DAOs who do not have a token um, or who don't plan on having a token versus ones that are bootstrapping like with a token. So I think off the bat, right, we have to separate the two um, and around the governance structures that we put in place, depending on if you're fall into one camp or the other. Um, sorry, pop-ups. Um, but yeah, I think uh, the opportunity cost of holding a currency and not doing anything uh, can could totally be built into a smart contract. And I think also that, you know, in terms of talking about participatory governance and if you should have one token, one vote, or if you should be one person, one vote, um, and this 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 tension, right, um, between like a populist governance or um, somebody with a lot of money who got in early, uh, insider trading governance. <laughs> um, this is this is a really 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 big problem uh, because if you didn't know about a protocol early and you didn't have an an, an, an you know a chance to get in on it early, you're never going to be able to make up um the voting power and this is a fundamental problem that we have in DAOs is how do you equitably distribute voting governance um abilities so uh in our DAO that's not an issue I don't think ever will be an issue but we see it uh <laughs> as a problem in you know in all the all the big DAOs that have you know that have delegates um i'm actually curious before we end this first half i'm wondering if vincent um would be willing to chime in uh coming from outside the space and being new in this conversation um because it is always the most useful to hear from people who are newest um, because it, it just throws a different perspective on what you see as normal, um, which we know this is not a normal conversation uh, overall. <laughs> and so having new people uh, participate is critical to reevaluating what we're thinking about. Yeah, so, so I've just been going through the, um, um, the incubator of uh, Revi DAO, which was 10 yeah. sessions. Yeah. So I'm already a bit used to the, the um the, the language right and um and the amount of information that you already uh, have among each other right um uh, and it's good i think to have um an out of the box view on things because I, I really like to, to to see where where does it fit in right like you have uh, you want to have everything in code i'm thinking more in a hybrid solution because if you Put things on paper. It's also super legal, right? Like it's um, mm -hmm. it's it's fixed in a way. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to, you know, restrict ourselves too much. I see this this focus a lot with techies, right? It all has to be uh, the solution has to be found in 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 tech. While there are many other things already around, like uh, and it, it's really good to hear your experience. There's so much that I still need to learn. But already I have some ideas like how we can learn from the mistakes. Like we don't want to give too much power uh, related to the economic interest of the like the token holders. So we thought of like uh, using the square root of their total tokens. So if somebody has like a million tokens, they can only have like a thousand times the voting power as somebody has for like one token. And we are also we we want to have like um, voting rounds where also the local community gets involved. So we don't mm -hmm. want to distribute power equally. Some people have more uh, expertise, right? So they need to like add up their expertise to their voting power. And also the locals, they could be um, uh, gifted some tokens based on which decision has to be made, right? Like if it's about noise or something 
Mm -hmm. and, you know, they, they will be uh, more important stakeholders. But uh, to answer your question, yeah, I, I think if you're coming from a space where you haven't heard anything about the Web3 stuff, it's not uh, possible to follow. So um, that was, I think that was an excellent, um, I think you, you made a couple of excellent points. And does anyone know um, how Dr. Bronner's works as a company? The so Dr. Bronner's is a soap company and he actually was like a huckster from germany who stole his family's soap recipe and like fled and came to america and like was a shyster but then also actually did start a soap company and now they're based out of california and his children or grandchildren run the company and the way the company works is the top paid employee cannot make more than 10 times the lowest paid employee and so it's an it's a way of addressing corporate um wealth in like wealth inequality right mainly in the private sector um and making it, but it's not a cooperative right it's not that model it is a traditional um uh private company, but they have it built in that the top person can only make 10 times what the bottom lowest paid employee makes. Um, and so th this point, Vincent, around the inverse voting proportions, right? Making sure that you only have so much um, um, difference between the voting powers of the individuals who are participating, I think is a really, really interesting idea. And uh, one thing in the Dow playbook, if you if you read it um, for the governance section, is that we there's a lot from models outside of Dow's right in the private sector, in the public sector that we can learn from. Right. And so we don't have to reinvent everything that we do here. There's a lot that we can take. There's a lot we can take from nature. Um, which Spencer knows I'm obsessed with emergent strategy and Peth knows I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> so there's a lot we can take from um, other ways that groups organize or that um, systems organize themselves that we can, you know, at some point put some part of it into a smart contract, right? Which brings us back to this idea of that we do want um, our decisions to be um, immutable, right? We do want them to be transparent. And that's the idea of having any of this on chain is that it is transparent and we are in control. Coming to the last point, which if we don't have electricity and internet, none of this matters anyway. Um, and so making sure that we are still um, holding ourselves accountable to the idea of a decentralized internet that is run by us and not run by Amazon. Um, so, um, I want to thank, uh, Alex, um, and your colleague whose name I can't remember at the moment, Jay, Jay, uh, for being here from Claros. And I did put their link claros.io in the chat. So if you have questions about using Claros, um, please feel free to reach out to them in our telegram group, um, or, or through their, you know, website and socials. Um, as a reminder, if uh, you have not minted the playbook, please mint the playbook, read the playbook, comment on the playbook. Um, this is a community effort, right? And we want everyone's knowledge to be captured um, in a way that's useful to other people here. Um, and then if you do want to start your DAO on optimism, we do have those grants um, uh, and awards available. So the, that announcement is on Twitter. It's also in our Telegram group. All right. Uh, so this is Spencer. Uh, Spencer, like he said, is with Juno Dow, and he's a Dow um, governance strategist. He is, um, I think, a friend. I would call Spencer a friend of mine. Uh, <laughs> and Spencer is very good at what he does. Um, he's a critical thinker. He's a listener. Um, he's uh, an illustrator, a writer. He's a man of many talents, and we're glad to have him here. Well, uh, thank you for having me and thank you for, for um, facilitating all of this. Uh, I have uh, like sort of a process in, in mind for this, but I also just wanted to get people's thoughts for what they wanted out of this. I shared a link to uh, this governance framework that I've been sharing as a template. I also walked people through this 
um, for Colony's DAO Club, one of their meetings a few months back. Um, so it's it's sort of like an opportunity if you if you if you're in a situation where you're in an early stage organization and you're trying to start up governance processes and have like kind of explicit an explicit framework for decision making and driving consent and everything, uh, this could be useful. Um, but I'm also interested in, in getting people's thoughts um, around governance in general. And there's this other broader like broader framework that I'm thinking about um, where instead of starting with governance, because like a couple of the, the, the DAOs I was with that didn't work out, didn't work out because we kind of dove right into governance before really aligning too much on what we're trying to do and why we're all here and, you know, establishing shared, um, shared, like mutually recognized boundaries of time commitments and like the purpose that, that drove us all here. And so I think there's that kind of earlier phase of sense making of like sense making and alignment um, and building trust and learning to understand one another and, you know, uh, and listening, like Elizabeth said, is really important there. And so I also shared a link to uh, a driver summary, which is a, a sociocratic practice. Um, we we had a couple of these talks at Opus Collective, and the the, uh, the facilitator there, uh, Michael, is a, a great sociocracy practitioner, and he walked us through this soci sociocracy practice called um, driver mapping. And that's an example of getting a group of people a group of people together within an organizational context, especially at an early stage, and just going through this process of identifying alignment and like key stakeholders, what people are trying to get out of things. And so that process, I think something like that should precede this kind of instituting governance frameworks that, that I'm talking about here. But if you are at that stage, it can be useful. So I'm, if, uh, if people are interested in this, I can share my screen and, and go through some of this stuff on the, in the governance phase. Do you think that would be, is this what you had in mind for the workshop, Elizabeth? Hi, else? great. Cool. Share my screen. It's still loading. So I have a, a Google Doc here that's um, just an easier way for people to to copy this, like this actual document. Um, also in the the article, I have it like the provisions there that you can put into an operating agreement. Um, I think the whole thing is backed up on Arweave too. But here's a link to the Google Doc if anyone wants to copy it or leave comments or or whatnot. Um, but I can also just start walking through this. So like when I when I made this, I hadn't I hadn't been acquainted with any kind of sociocracy practices or or hadn't really it hadn't really dawned on me how important this kind of collective sense making was for an organization before governance is to be instituted. Um, so like now I'm looking at this and I think something like this can still work, but it would work best if followed if it follows this kind of earlier phase of sense making and people just you know, reaching alignment and, and identifying what we're working on together. Uh, but once that kind of general sense of alignment is established, then I think it can it can be prudent to set up formal governance processes. And then I think once sense making and governance are covered, then like operations should be a lot easier. Which is like a, Elizabeth made a point earlier of like what's what's the mission of this of this organization? Like what what are we all here to do? And all the operations involved there. But I think like jumping straight to that can have a lot of weird implications and miscommunications and, and friction and maybe even liability um, if you don't have sense making and, and governance set up first. And if you jump straight to governance without a lot of the sense making up front, it can just lead you down these rabbit holes of, you know, DAOs as in dudes arguing online about just mechanism design endlessly for a kind of perfectionistic uh, governance processes. Uh, I'm sure that's that sucked up a lot of our time and I feel like a lot of that dialogue, a lot of the conflict in designing governance frameworks can be avoided if that group of people spends time up front identifying their shared purpose and learning to communicate with one another and identifying how they can work together and, and why they should work together on more of like a, a why level than a how. I think the governance is a bit more about how and like formalizing how so that you can do the, the what of operations later on. So I can jump into this and explain how this document here is intended to work. Um, this isn't, this is sort of like a, a pseudo legal, I say pre-constitutional uh, governance framework here because it's designed, I'm not a lawyer, but this is designed to sort of precede entity formation. Uh, something like this could 
potentially like segue into a formal operating agreement. You can use some of this language uh, in the article. I, I shared the, a link to this Google Doc, and also in the article, I have some examples of what provisions could look like in an operating agreement if you wanted to have a governance framework like this within your entity. Um, but you also don't need an entity to adopt something like this. This can be as simple as a group of five people meeting on a Zoom link once a week that just agree to make decisions collectively according to processes designated and defined in this document. Um, and I think that the idea there is just to establish a more or less objective, or at least uh, con like consent-based framework for decision-making and, and uh, so just as like a process we can rely on and, and know that all decisions made were made by this, according to this process that people consented to up front. Uh, and I think if, in the absence of a process like that, you can have a bunch of conflict and people not being on the same page, people kind of working in different directions. Um, but yeah, the idea here is to designate certain governance platforms and processes. It doesn't need to be Web3, but it can. Like you can specify um, designated governance platform here, uh, uh, de designated a drafting platform for like, uh, drafting proposals, it can just be Google Docs, it can be Charmverse, uh, anything like that. Uh, you can swap out these things. The, the whole idea is you can have uh, Web 2 or Web 3 tools according to what is best suited for your organization. But the main thing that this framework is built around is this three-stage proposal process of drafting, uh, voting, and executing. And you can swap this around as well, but this is just the kind of boilerplate language I have for this, this framework here where a group of people agree on how to start drafting a proposal. And this is where a proposal would be open for feedback and get buy-in from stakeholders up front so that the proposal isn't just new to people when they're voting on it. And then you can define how long this process is of drafting. Um, Drafting duration here, minimum drafting duration can be five days. You designate where the drafting can be. Um, you can designate who gets to give feedback to these things. If, it, if you want it to be open or public, if you want to build in public or build in private. And then onto the active kind of voting stage. And this is where you specify stuff like voting majority and quorum and method and platform and duration. Again, it can be Web3 um, or Web 2.5-ish. You can use snapshot, um, it can be a, a multi-sig, it can be a, a governor contract, uh, it can be totally off-chain if you want. Um, you can specify all these things in, in this kind of modular framework for just defining in as minimally ambiguous fashion how your organization goes about making decisions. Um, and then once like the drafting and the voting stage is done, um, then it's more just about execution, and that's sort of less, uh, this, this framework is concerned less with execution. That's sort of like once a proposal passes both those stages, it sort of leaves the purview of this, this framework, but you can expand it if you wanted there to be additional established processes for retrospectives or checking in on active proposals. Um, if you wanted some kind of budget for a proposal to be dispersed, and like tranches or something, you can include a template for that. Um, but this is intended just to be a, a general purpose governance framework for early stage organizations. And again, it can bleed into, or you can, I kind of segue into uh, a more legally binding operating agreement if you wanted to use, like recycle some of this governance language. Uh, and again, I included some example provisions in that, uh, in that article I shared. Um, but that's that's the overall gist of it. So I'm, I'm curious if people thought that was clearly communicated or if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to get into it. Question. Um, what, one, I think this is like, yeah, this is really nice. It is very clear. Um, and I think it, um, yeah, anticipates a lot of like things that you need to get clear at the beginning stages of a DAO. Um, I wonder, uh, my question is like, uh, so have you, what, what thought have you given to breaking up the proposal template into like specific genres? 
I mean, I, I, I do really like that idea, like kind of forking this and having different versions of it that are suited for different organizational needs, you mean? Is that sort of what you have in mind? Yeah, because it was like, I generally think of like proposals as being um, proposals over a treasury uh, mm -hmm. or being like, like, especially like an on-chain fashion, right? Like on-chain votes are typically like an action to be taken with funds, right? Or over a shared uh, resource of some kind. Um, and then you have your like more symbolic, um, you know, like uh, organizational goals or uh, str strategic goals or, um, you know, something like that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, because it's, it's one thing that we're sort of dealing with right now is like breaking out the proposals into like, say, um, you know, establishing a work stream, right? Saying like, okay, here's a work stream for engineering. They have this amount of budget and uh, this amount of like discretionary budget. Uh, budget. Um, and then, you know, like uh, we include like a sunset provision. Um, so that like, okay, you know, work stream runs out and must be reauthorized over like a, a, a certain period of time. And yeah, I guess I was just wondering like what, what other, so like, and then there's like, uh, say individual contractor agreements, right? So like we would say like a core team member, someone who is uh, in our model, right? Like you have a core team member, a core team member is then able to make the proposal for a work stream, which includes like a discretionary budget. And I was what, again, I guess the question is like, what other sort of genres of decisions um, do you think can be made into specific proposal types? Oh, okay. That, that's a great question. And I think like, th like thankfully the way this is constructed is such that it, it's like all this process here, it's kind of like meta, meta proposal governance stuff is, is like agnostic to the actual template of the proposal itself. Uh, so you can have multiple pro proposal templates that can be fed through this governance process at, at a drafting stage and an active stage. So like if you, if a group of people were to, to like ratify it or, or consent to a governance framework like this, they could have multiple proposal templates. And one of them could be a contractor agreement. Um, another one could be like a, a project scope for a team within that organization um, with, with sunset provisions, with uh, like ongoing budget kind of milestones. And you can have a number of different templates here that are, can be used for different purposes, and they can all be fed through this um, through this governance process in terms of just a drafting stage and a voting stage. Um, that's that's really what this framework itself is mostly concerned with. Um, but to your question about other other genres for proposals, um, it could, there there can be another one for if you wanted to like add someone to a core team or a, or a board. There can be some some other template you have for that for proposals and that alongside some like another one that you mentioned was like a some kind of contractor agreement those can be different proposal templates that can be filled out um and but they can both be fed through this this process and this process can be can be uniform or you can say like oh you know for voting duration maybe for certain types of proposals you want a voting duration to be longer so you can like specify that up here or if you just want the same voting duration for all kinds of proposals regardless of whatever proposal genre it is uh, you can have it be uniform. Um, does that does that sort of address your, your question there? It does. I mean, um, I, I, again, I'm, I'm like thinking through a lot of these issues personally for us right now. And um, yeah, and then I guess like maybe a follow-up question would be like, what do you see as like the, like the init DAO proposals, right? So like, so for instance, um, if if you know like the kinds of proposals are like setting up a work stream setting up uh, a you know core team contractor agreements or something like that it also implies that there's some like evaluatory mechanism um uh, that says like whether or not that proposal was successful maybe even by its own own metrics and so would it be that there is like there are like a couple proposals that like out of the box for any DAO that's starting like hey we need to make a proposal to establish the functionally the justice system right like who 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 has the authority to review whether or not like a proposal was successful um and and yeah so like what do you what do you see as maybe being some of those like again like init dao constructor methods you know for for lack of a better term i, I love that term actually um I, I like the the idea of this kind of um kind of like highly generalized kind of init proposal template and that's that's sort of what what I have here, although what I have here doesn't account for some of the, the things you said, like designating authority for reviewing success metrics, or if there's any other kind of evaluative 
council or something you wanted to designate. But this one here, this this proposal template, which is a fork of the template we used at Lobby 3 for a couple of years, uh, tweaked a little bit and kind of shortened. Um, this this one was intended as like a, a general purpose proposal that like you can use like you can use this proposal template itself to ratify this governance framework to kind of like bootstrap a, a governance framework from 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 nothing uh, like if you're just operating in this kind of amorphous kind of uh, pre pre governance phase of an early stage organization you could fill out a proposal with these parameters and just use that use this proposal template itself to establish this whole governance framework uh, you know you would just have um, I mean, it would be bootstrapping. So if you wanted to do this on snapshot, you would fill out this template and then specify snapshot up here in the voting platform. So you can use this to initialize governance as like a this this one here, or you can take some of these um, and include them in a different proposal template. Um, but but yeah, I mean that this one is sort of intended as a as a general general purpose one, and it can be used to initialize an organization. But you may also want to add some other some other uh, fields or properties if, if this isn't thorough enough. It's a, it's sort of like um, deciding you're going to use Roberts and then having everybody agree that they're going to use Roberts rules and then using Roberts rules. So <laughs> um, what's nice about this is this uh, template that Spencer has is um, you can sort of modify it to meet whatever needs you are at sort of whatever stage you are and whether you want to use it to set up further processes you can or like spencer said you can use it to even um as simply the pre-governance structure right that then gives you a constitution or an operating agreement that you then follow so I think what's nice about this is it can kind of it can function at several levels depending on what your DAO or your organization needs, and it's um, flexible enough that it can meet you at whatever technological level your group operates within. And, and it's also interesting because in these in these early phases, the only thing really legitimizing a governance framework like this in the absence of any like legally binding agreement is just the buy-in from the people participating and so like that's that's why i was stressing earlier that like to to meaningfully establish something like this it should follow some some phase of just discussions and kind of internal sense making and alignment for like like what what are we here to do together what is this organization for um you know, like, how can we work together and respect boundaries in a sustainable way? I feel like that, that's one thing that's been a really big learning curve for me in DAOs is, like, expectations of, like, contributors' time and, and energy and, you know, the likelihood and the duration it would take for them to be compensated for that and, and just trying to come to terms with as much of that as possible up front um, just so that, just to avoid burnout because in so many of these, at least for, from my experience, so many, so many of these early stage DAOs have, you know, funding issues, especially if they're concerned with public goods and just like recognizing all those boundaries before making any formal agreements, I think can be really important. But yeah, this, this is intended to be very general purpose and, um, and kind of maneuverable. Like you can, you can ditch it when you want to form an entity uh, and have like legally binding agreements, or you can carry over some of the language, or you can actually ratify this as a governance agreement, you can have like an operating agreement defer to this, you can have provisions in an operating agreement defer to a document like this for governance purposes. Um, it just depends on, on your organizational needs. And like Vincent said, you know, paper works also. And in the playbook, you'll see that um, somebody made the point that um, your discord rules will also serve if you have nothing else in place. So the point is that you have something intentional in place that you really think through what do you want to signal as the place people go to reference how the organization functions. Exactly, because like if it's if you don't have something like that, then it's sort of 
people may be may have different conceptions of how governance works. It may then there's like all these kind of soft power, um, structuralist kind of issues of, of how decisions get made and people not being on the same page and constantly having to repeat things or like uh, constantly kind of doing this ad hoc governance process that's different every time. So it's not quite standardized. So I think it's, even if it is just discord rules to start uh, having something kind of objective to point to um, that's, that's fixed and that people buy into and, and agree with. I think that's, that's really the, the best way to get organizational governance started. For sure. I, I mean, I fully agree. I mean, I think, um, you know, again, I don't, I don't really want to monopolize conversation, but, uh, um, our, uh, yeah, when we started as a team of four, um, sort of self-funded and then we, um, established what I called like the proto governance framework, right. Which was just a, a set of very simple rules. It was, uh, we have to have unanimous consent to make, uh, like three genres of decision. Um, and it was adding or removing a team member, um, spending money in any discretionary sense or, uh, empowering a team member with a work stream. And so those are, well, those are, those are like the three sort of examples that I initially give. Um, and, and I guess that's what it is right now. I'm trying to like, uh, build out our governance because we we're, we've gone through the process of like, we've added a bunch of team members. We're using coordinate to do like a retroactive distribution of uh, a token. And I'm trying to build out like, you know, the actual technical specifications of the DAO and, and outline again, sort of what, what are like specific genres of DAO proposals that we could then enforce on chain with with uh what will be just like a very simple token vote but evolving from that sort of like unanimous consent into into something a little bit more democratic i mean i really like your point about the genres of, of proposals too i think that's something i may try to elaborate on a bit more in here uh, so i have a question though for you on that point um as you've added team members, do each of those additional team members, um, or stated another way, do the four core members, are those still the only ones able to vote on proposals? So, yes, right now. Um, okay. okay. I, think, I think that's a really good example of a core team model versus um like an, an egalitarian model or you know and and when and it sounds to me like you're talking about when do you when does that when do you hit a tipping point with that yeah i mean we've we've hit the tipping point right okay. so like we are our, our coordinate our retroactive coordinate brown ends tomorrow mm -hmm. um and at that point we'll have like a relative distribution of tokens to like everybody who's been a team member Mm -hmm. um and then you know again we're, we're probably not going to enforce the but we'll distribute you know some sort of representative token eventually mm -hmm. our token wants to have you know is, is sort of integral to the utility of the system not mm -hmm. to get too deep into that but like um and then we can just do snapshot votes um and so everybody on the team and then so at this point we're evolving from like this core team to to having like unanimous consent to the core team members to then within these like sort of proposal genres we're going to start setting, you know, like uh, voting thresholds, quorum requirements. But it's still, you know, like I, I think we're uh, like 12, 13 people now. So so it's not huge. Right. And the distribution is relative, according to a coordinate Brown, um, uh, rather than any sort of like pre-existing agreements. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, we're, we're just we're, you know, going from dictatorship to democracy. Right. So this mm -hmm. is this is sort of just like the next um, metamorphosis. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Should I stop uh, presenting this or did anyone else have any other questions? Um, I think uh, my next Thing I have, Spencer, unless you have something else you want to talk about, is um, how you transition to a legal entity um, and the role that governance, like the, the tie in right to a legal entity and governance. Um, okay. We have not talked about that yet, um, but I think it's a consideration that a lot of DAOs uh, struggle with uh, early on and then also as they scale. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to talk about this. Um... Uh, I actually just like a, like a week and a half ago, uh, we just formed a 
uh, Wyoming DAO LLC for an open civics organization. And it's interesting to see, like we use this platform doula, which is like a mm -hmm. uh, compliance service provider and they, and they handle filings for entity formation and whatnot, like reg like registered agent stuff. Um, and they offer Wyoming DAO LLC as an entity you can form. And they generate a lot of like boilerplate documentation for this. And it includes some, some language that, uh, like at, at, at LexDAO, we've been using terminology like designated contracts, like designated governance contracts and designated smart contracts. Um, and what that would mean here, I can, I can share a different screen actually. Um, let's see here. I thought I had something else. Uh, anyway, I can I can just explain it like this. Um, but in the in the operating agreement that was generated for the Wyoming DAO LLC, there are provisions there for specifying which smart contract is like, officially recognized by the organization as the governance contract, and that can be a multi sig, it can be a a, a Moloch contract, a, or a governor contract, anything to that effect, um, or a, any other kind of custom governance situation you want. Uh, the interesting part is when you start marrying on-chain governance with legalese and, and legal documentation um, is that you have to like the, the actual documents serve sort of as this interface between what is like legally enforceable and like legally binding agreements between people versus like the technology side of things that actually facilitates the operations and the governance. Uh, and it's cool marrying them like that because then like th there was one question someone had earlier about uh, how does your organization like adapt over time and how can you like adapt a governance framework? Uh, in this case, what's interesting um, you can do is uh, you can just make amendments to the operating agreement. If you wanted to designate a different governance contract or if you wanted to move to a, to a new governance framework, it would just be a matter of whoever's, whoever in the entity has the ability to vote on amendments to the document someone would just propose some alteration to the operating agreement, uh, like designating a different governance contract, like say we're moving to a different multi-sig or say we're moving from a governance, from a governor contract to a, a Moloch contract or something like that. It would just be a matter of swapping out the uh, contract addresses and maybe some other language in the operating agreement and then voting on that and keeping that kind of, um, that kind of ratification in, in your internal minutes or recording or something. And then it's like, like magic. It's like you've just switched to a different governance framework, and so that's that's one example. And I'm not sure how. I know the Wyoming DAO LLC has been around since uh, 2001. I mean, uh, to 2021. Um, and so I I don't know how much precedent there is of like really using this or like what kind of organizations generally use this. Um, Wyoming also just passed the uh, decentralized unincorporated nonprofit association uh, act i think um so that that's a new new entity there that's uh, just like a, a a bit more of a blockchain based version of the unincorporated nonprofit association um so there's a couple options like that i haven't i haven't dealt with the aduna yet but that, that's like one example of how you can use on-chain governance and kind of adapt that just by uh, amending operating agreements spencer can you um add the link to doula i'm assuming it's not d-o-u-l-a which is a you know somebody who helps you have a baby oh that's that's it yeah you've got the right link there i got the right one okay yeah. okay thanks <laughs> yeah that's what we used it was very very smooth um oh yeah sorry i didn't see that with the question in the chat there no, no that's totally fine yeah yeah kara hey spencer um okay so this is really great discussion because we actually right now our status is um a, a nonprofit based in california but we're going to be setting up a an entity a new entity and moving over to panama uh, there's actually a great organization called corporatio it starts with a k um and they're forming offshore organizations but i know the founder well and it's like nice because it doesn't feel like a sketchy kind of like offshore mm -hmm. thing. Um, and what's cool about some of the structures they do, I'm not familiar with all the jurisdictions, but Panama is like a hybrid corporation, foundation, and DAO. 
structure on the blockchain. And so there's a lot of, it seems like good positive benefits for, for being a part of that along with taxes. Um, so I was curious, like, I, I, I know his organization supports in, you know, the legal formation and some other things, but that's what I was looking at with doula here. Maybe I'll sign up for a consultation. Is this, do you know if this is mostly just like Wyoming DAOs or if it's for other organizations? Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, I, I know they have other options as well. Um, like we were considering a, um, a Delaware non-stock corporation as well. I believe they had that as an option, uh, but I know they have more than a, a DAO. Okay. Let's see, let's, let's see what their, their options are. Um, I, I can reach out to them too, but this sounds like a really useful service. Um, because okay. I, yeah, I'm like, okay, so probably I need to, you know, move everything over with like agreements and I guess find a Panama based lawyer or, you know, but if there's services, something like this that do it more on a global scale or something, that would be great. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. Go ahead, Spurs. Oh yeah, just a quick uh, answer there. Uh, it looks like Doula offers services for um, an LLC, a DAO LLC, and a C Corp. Um, I'm not sure if those are just limited to certain states within the U.S. or if they have a variety of options there. But I just shared a link where they they oh, share thanks, yeah. these options. Yeah. DAO LLC. That's cool. It, it, is that would that only be Wyoming DAO probably? Yeah, well, I, I think Tennessee had a has a similar one, but I, I'm not sure. I could have that wrong. I think I think Tennessee followed Wyoming in setting up a DAO LLC entity. And this is another really good point about like where are your members based? Where what is your um what your DAO's offering? Like, is it um located anywhere in any way that um you know you would have to make considerations for uh the tax and regulatory implications with various statuses. Um, so that comes um, to that first point Spencer is making about sense making uh, and alignment so that uh, you do pick the right formation for your DAO and that you have the ability to adapt or change that should um, your DAO membership change um, in a way that uh, you would want different legal um, protections or options, um, depending on where, where your organization is domiciled. Totally. Right. And then the, 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 another consideration there for entity types that makes a lot of this, uh, makes, makes life even more difficult for DAOs is a lot of these entity options, most of them, uh, are really do force centralization for like mm -hmm. purposes of compliance and accountability. Um, I think especially with this corporate transparency act now. Um, I think that has some other implications here, but like there need there would need to be a responsible party for to interface with the IRS and people that are like listed as registered agents or incorporators for the entity. Um, and then if you if your entity has like a fiat bank account, there's limitations around that as well. Um, but I think one thing to look into if if anyone's curious in in like decentralization friendly legal engineering is uh, is the Duna. Um, example I, I gave, I can find a link for that as well. Duna, okay. Yeah, this would be a great service if someone expanded Doula like globally to different regions outside of the US, you know. I mean, maybe Corporatio can do some of this too, but then you go into the details of, yeah, like all the agreements or the uh, contractor agreements and things like that. So that has to maybe be uh, locally guided by a, lo a local lawyer in Panama, I'm assuming. Well, and I know a lot of people here have lo know lots of DAO lawyers. So if you ever have a question about where to find a ref reputable DAO lawyer, lots of people in DAO Summer and DAO Spring know lots of lawyers. Yeah, oh, well, okay. like Adam Miller was just in the, in the call to the thriller.eth. Um, he's with my DAO for Marshall Island DAO entity formation. Here's a little article on Wyoming Dunas. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Vincent, what are you guys doing for a legal um, entity or, um, yeah. Yeah, so we have we have it the other way around. We already have uh, an existing nonprofit for a couple of years with some tax benefits. And then we set up um, a holding and an SPV per project. So we basically want to integrate the DAO in the nonprofit side. And we are now uh, transitioning to a steward ownership model. So then we separate the economic and the decision making power. So the um, it's not that the shareholders have the most power and the shareholders are token holders in this situation. So the decision making power, um, there's like a golden share sort of situation, which is whole uh, held by the by the nonprofit. And that's what we want to take care of with the uh, with the DAO. Not sure if you understand. Mm -hmm. And we are based in the Netherlands, so it's a different situation, right? Uh, I think for now, Denmark and uh, Germany have the best uh, legal frameworks for this kind of steward ownership models, but I'm not aware of everything around. I will say um, this is something uh, that I think that we need more education around in general, um, our non-US models um, outside of Marshall Islands. Um, and I know new ones are coming all the time. Um, so this is one of those fields that uh, you know takes a lot of effort to stay on top of, but does affect your governance framework, right? <laughs> like, very I think a bit limited as a US citizen, right? Because you're excluded from a lot of uh, existing frameworks and uh, it's like in the in Europe, we can easily set up uh, an Estonian company or register in Lisbon, or I'm not sure if, if they allow, like even for investment opportunities, often US citizens are excluded because, you know, like the possible lawsuits <laughs> that follow. So I'm not sure how, um, how your uh, possibilities are there in Europe, but definitely worth uh, looking into. Yeah. I, uh, I I do have to switch to another call in a few minutes, but I can stick around if there's any other kind of wrapping up process or if anyone has any other questions. Anybody got any questions for Spencer? Well, Spencer's on all the socials, especially Warpcast, um, and in all the channels. So feel free to reach out to him. Um, he's great. He helps lots of DAOs. Um, and uh, is always open to feedback about any of these uh, templates. So uh, feel free to iterate with him. Uh, so thanks, Spence, very much. Uh, if you have not joined the Telegram group, more people have joined today. Awesome. Thank you. Um, feel free to join our Telegram group. Feel free to um, join the uh, Charmverse for your DAO, the page, and actually work on your, feel free to work on your DAO there. And like Pat said, we did get the amazing Optimism grant uh, to build your DAO on Optimism. So if you want an opportunity, sorry, need to shake everything here. <laughs> if you want an opportunity to win some money for your DAO, um, consider uh, doing it uh, there. And if you have any questions about that process, feel free to reach out to Pat or myself um, we're happy to help in any way or answer any questions um, about that. Um, I have a hard stop at one o'clock, so um, I won't be able to stay around after that. Um, but is, is there anything further <laughs> anyone wants to bring up in the last couple minutes here? Uh, we've covered a lot. Of, we've covered a lot. We've covered like, you know, sort of elements of tokenomics and how that affects your governance elements of what you know size you are what, what you're offering as a DAO is how that affects your governance what kind of consensus um mechanisms you want to use have used or are considering using how your legal framework affects your governance um so i think we've we've really covered a lot here today um and appreciate everyone who has shared who's asked questions 
Um, and we have two more weeks left. So uh, thank you for everyone who has been doing this uh, for the last six weeks. Um, I believe Christina will be moderating next week and then Path will be wrapping us up on week eight. Um, so make sure to stick around uh, for the next two weeks if uh, you're able to. Um, Jean, you are you are newer. You, you, you just joined. So um, if there's anything that you missed that you want to catch up on, this is going to be recorded. We will have it available later. Um, but you can also ask any questions in the Telegram group um, that uh, you might have about, about governance. And don't forget to mint the playbook. It would be very helpful to all of us. Um, <laughs> we all worked really hard on it. A lot of great um, thinkers and, and Taoists participated um, in Tao Sumber and then in terms of putting it together uh, for, for, you know, for public use. Okay, folks, well, then maybe we'll give it a wrap a few minutes early. Um, oh, Vincent, I'm sorry, it's all right. The Telegram group will stay active. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, uh, I'll see you there. Some of you, I'll see you in the next couple of weeks and the rest of you, uh, we'll see you when we see you. And uh, if you have friends who are interested in starting DAOs or learning about DAOs, please refer them to maybe not join Dow Spring itself as the accelerator, but we are having Dow Summer, which is gonna be six weeks of various activities. Um, it's like local Dow Summer. So there's actually gonna be some in-person events in various locations. Um, and there's going to be a lot of conversation around very localized um, decentralized solutions. I th that kind of sounds like an oxymoron, but it, but it's not really. Um, so feel free to uh, start participating. That'll be July, uh, mostly July and August. Um, and then, yeah, the Dow train is going to keep on chugging. Um, <laughs> and uh, for anyone, uh, your projects at large, um, if you are interested, you know, you can feel free to post about them in our Telegram group. You know, we are always... Um, excited to learn about um, the new DAOs and the old DAOs who are doing awesome things um, and the new ones. So appreciate all of you and all the hard work you're putting into this. And thank you for, for facilitating this panel and workshop. My pleasure. Okay, folks, well, I'm gonna call it a wrap then. All right. Bye everyone. Ciao. Bye. Bye.